Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the uh, new uh, 2021 Pareto Lecture at Collegio Carlo Alberto. I am Giorgio Barba Navaretti. I am the president of Collegio Carlo Alberto. I am really pleased to open this uh, new lecture. Uh, our guest uh, tonight uh, will be Gianluca Violante. Gianluca Violante is a professor of economics at Princeton University, and he's also a member of the advisory board of Collegio Carlo Alberto. I'm not saying anything more about Gianluca because uh, Francesca Parodi, who is assistant professor at Il Collegio Carlo Alberto, will introduce uh, Gianluca. Uh, the lecture will be on macroeconomics and inequality and essentially will bring in, a, a, if you want, the perspective of heterogeneity in a macroeconomic outcome. Uh, this is a very, very interesting development of uh, economic analysis that takes essentially into account distributive issues that uh, for before in macroanalysis were less considered, if you wish, and this is very important. It's important in many different domains, whether we're discussing household, people, individuals, firms, et cetera. So the, the idea that we can bring in inequality through an heterogeneity approach into macroeconomic outcome, uh, we think it's really, really important. So the lecture of today will be very topical and very, very interesting. Uh, Gianluca, thank you for having accepted to be with us uh, tonight. Uh, I must say we're very proud of our Pareto Lecture. Uh, Pareto Lecture started in 2007, and uh, you know your, your predecessors at uh, Pareto Lecture, many of them won the Nobel Prize. Uh, we had uh, Michael Kramer, Jean Tirol, Angus Deaton, Thomas uh, Sargent, James Heckman. And normally people win the Nobel Nobel Prize more or less from five to 10 years after giving the, the Pareto lecture. So Gianluca, you still have five to 10 years to go. Uh, and I really hope this will be the final outcome. It would be great actually for you and for everybody. I'm afraid it's, I'm afraid it's correlation, not causation, but uh, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, we like, to th we like to think it's causation. Yeah, we like to think it's causation. <laughs> I think you should leave us in this illusion eh, right. that it is causation. And uh, anyway, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I will leave the floor to Francesca. Just the last question. You see there is a little icon on the bottom of your screen, which is Q&A or D and R, depending if you have an Italian or an English screen or maybe in other languages, I don't know. Anyway, you, if you have questions for Gianluca, you write your question there, and then Francesca will, uh, after, after Gianluca's lecture, will transfer the question to uh, Gianluca. So it will be at the end of the lecture that we will have a little bit of a Q&A session. Uh, Gianluca, you, you go on for more or less one hour, and then we can have another half hour of Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, Francesca, the floor is yours. So thank you, Giorgio. I hope you can all see my screen. Um, so welcome uh, everyone to the 2021 uh, Pareto Lecture. Um, so as Giorgio said, uh, the Wilfredo Pareto Lecture uh, has been delivered uh, um, by a set of very distinguished scholars since 2007 in honor of Wilfredo Pareto, who was an alumnus of the University of Torino and Politecnico of Torino, and who gave fundamental contributions in economic sociology and political science. And this year, we're very happy to have Gianluca Violante joining this uh, uh, amazing list of, uh, of speakers. So thanks, Gianluca, for being with us uh, today. Um, it is a particular honor and pleasure for me to introduce Gianluca uh, today, uh, as he's really an outstanding economist and a role model for uh, young researchers like me. Uh, he is one of the most influential scholars in macroeconomics uh, and in economics more in general, I would say. Uh, indeed, um, in his research, he has spanned a variety of fields and topics. Um, this is a non-exhaustive list. So he's worked on labor economics, public finance, household finance, monetary economics, intergenerational mobility and econometrics and more. Um, and moreover, he hasn't been afraid of mixing different approaches and methodologies 
uh, in addressing these topics, um, going from theoretical analysis to computational me methods and quantitative models, um, and empirical analysis on macro and micro data. So really, uh, he has uh, crossed all the imaginary borders between fields and methodologies in order to address uh, relevant research questions. And he has done so in a very successful uh, way, as we can see from his CV and amazing achievements. So uh, he got his laurea in Economia from University of Torino in 1992. Then he moved to the US where he uh, got an MA and a PhD in economics from University of Pennsylvania in 1994 and 1997, respectively. Um, then he started his academic career as lecturer and then reader in the Department of Economics of University College London, where he stayed from 1997 to 2002. Then he moved back to the US where he was assistant professor, then associate professor, then full professor, and then William R. Berkeley professor uh, in the Department of Economics of NYU from 2002 to uh, 2017. Um, and then in 2017, uh, he moved to Princeton University where he currently is professor in the Department of Economics. Um, he's also a member uh, uh, of a number of uh, prestigious societies and research centers. He's fellow of the Econometric Society, research associate of the NBR, research fellow of the CPR and ISA, and international fellow of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, external research member of CBI in Copenhagen. Um, as for his editorial positions, he has been coordinating editor of the Review of Economic Dynamics from 2009 to 2013, co-editor of Econometrica from 2015 to 2019, and he currently is associate editor of the Journal of Economic Perspective and one of the co-leaders of the NBR uh, Economic Fluctuations and Growth Group uh, on Microdata and Macro Models. Uh, most recently, he has won the very prestigious uh, uh, economics in central banking award for his um, American Economic Review article titled Monetary Policy According to Hank in 2019. Um, a bit of bibliometric info. So he has more than 50 peer reviewed uh, published articles, most of which are uh, our top fives. Um, more than 14,000 citations and an age index of 40. So, uh, given how productive uh, Gianluca uh, has been and is, um, it would be really impossible for me to go over each and every one of his uh, contributions. So what I'll try to do instead, and I'll be very brief, is to um, highlight a common thread uh, that I think links many of his most cited uh, papers. And this, this common thread is um, precisely this approach of bringing uh, heterogeneity among economic agents, which uh, has been traditionally a microeconomic uh, uh, feature into macroeconomic models. And with this approach is really shaping and influencing the direction in which uh, frontier macroeconomic research is, is going. Um, so in a first line of research, um, Gianluca has looked at the um, importance of heterogeneity for studying uh, inequality uh, along several dimensions. And in particular, he has uh, shed light on how important it is to take into account the whole distribution of the measure of interest uh, instead of, of the, the ag aggregate or the average, being it wages, hours of work, wealth, consumption, and to take into account this, this distribution and the evolution of this distribution but over time and over the life cycle in order to study such a complex issue uh, such as inequality. In a second line of research, uh, um, Gianluca has looked um, more specifically at the implications of, of heterogeneity among uh, households or economic agents uh, for uh, fiscal policies. Um, here he has uh, a number of contributions that um, 
have uh, adopted a, a quantitative, both positive and normative analysis per perspective into studying fiscal policies um, that take into account uh, the heterogeneity across uh, households. So how heterogeneous households react differently to uh, the same uh, fiscal measure. So to give you an example, uh, he introduced this new and very powerful concept of uh, wealthy hand-to-mouth households that are households that are wealthy in terms of illiquid assets, but hand-to-mouth in terms of, of liquid assets. And therefore, uh, they react um, much more strongly to a, a fiscal stimulus uh, reform, such as an income tax rebate, than other uh, households. Um, Finally, in a most recent line of research, uh, Gianluca and his co-authors have looked at uh, bringing heterogeneity among agents uh, into uh, monetary policy models in order to study the transmission mechanisms of monetary policy in a more sophisticated uh, way. And in particular, um, Gianluca has introduced this new class of models um, for which he and his co-authors created this, uh, this acronym HANK, which stays for Heterogeneous Agents New Keynesian Models. Um, and these models are, are uh, going to replace the um, traditional uh, representative agents, uh, dynamic, stochastic, and general equilibrium models that have been adopted so far in, uh, in monetary policies and in, in, uh, in central banking uh, uh, more in general. So uh, time is, uh, is really running uh, fast. So, and I think Jan look than I can do about this. So without further ado, I will uh, leave the floor to Gianluca for the 2021 um, Wilfredo Pareto lecture, which is titled Macroeconomics and uh, Inequality. All right, uh, Francesca, thank you so much. This was really quite an introduction. Uh, I am uh, um, really grateful uh, for the time you spent uh, <laughs> looking at, at, at my work and summarizing it. Uh, you really set high standards for, for my talk and I, I hope to deliver. Um, I'm really delighted about th this invitation, not just because, uh, you know, I think the title of this lecture is definitely one of the coolest in the profession and I can't wait to, to put it on my CV, uh, but mostly because, uh, as uh, 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 Francesca said and many of you know, uh, the University of Torino is my alma mater. Um, and so it feels a little bit like, you know, going kind of full circle after like a long journey that started in the kind of late 80s when I was an undergraduate student in Torino. And I, I, I kind of took a peek at the list of uh, attendees and I saw many of my, my former teachers there, um, uh, Elsa Fornero, Mario, Bruno Contini, uh, who's actually uh, uh, responsible for planting the seeds of my passion for, for macro labor. Um, and, and many, many others. I have really a, a great memory of, of those years. And it's also clear that the University of Torino and the College of Carlo Alberto have continued the tradition of, of great education from, from the new courts of, uh, of young economists that, uh, that you keep producing uh, every, every year. Uh, so overall, I'm, I'm extremely proud of my uh, academic uh, origins. Um, and on this note, let me uh, start uh, sharing my screen. The title of my uh, lecture today is uh, uh, Microeconomics and Equality, and I should start by saying that it's based on uh, joint work with Greg Kaplan and Ben Moll um, and on uh, uh, lectures on similar topics that uh, they have uh, uh, given uh, over the past uh, couple of years. Um, okay, so I want to start from uh, what is the main takeaway uh, of this lecture, um, which is the following. that The relationship between uh, macroeconomics and inequality is really like a two-way street, uh, meaning that macroeconomic shocks affect inequality and inequality or the distribution of resources across uh, uh, agents, across agents of the economy, affects the evolution of macroeconomic aggregates. And you may think it's sort of kind of obvious uh, that that is the case, uh, but you know, it turns out that even though macroeconomists have worked on uh, uh, inequality and distribution for over 30 years, uh, it's only in the last generation of macroeconomic models that Basically, we have this kind of uh, you know, two-way feedback from the macroeconomy to inequality and inequality to the macroeconomy. Um, 
So the plan for today is to uh, uh, go through a, a brief uh, history of uh, uh, macroeconomics um, and get to the point of what I call the third generation uh, macroeconomic theories, uh, which fully embed uh, this uh, sort of arrow going in both directions. And uh, uh, it's uh, what I like to call uh, you know, a distribution of macroeconomics. So macroeconomics is really about uh, the distributional uh, implications of shocks, uh, policy reforms, um, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to give you uh, three examples of this kind of third generation macro theory at work in the second part of my, of my talk. Um, so let me start right away uh, with what I think is uh, uh, like a, a common definition of macroeconomics, which I think is a, is a useful starting point for, for all of us um, to get you all on board. Um, I think most uh, economists would define uh, macroeconomics as sort of a theoretical um, uh, models and empirical measurements of growth and business cycles. So the longer determinants of economic prosperity of nations and short-term fluctuations in aggregate economic activity. Now, in fact, if you think about the, the titles of the uh, sort of uh, 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 main macro research programs at the NDR and the CPR, one is called economic fluctuations and growth, and the other one is called uh, growth, there are two in the CPR, growth, and uh, the other one is uh, monetary economics and fluctuations. And, you know, in neither of them, there is uh, an explicit mention of income distribution. Uh, this is uh, clearly a heritage from the past. Um, and, that, uh, you know, the, the situation today, the state of the, of, of the discipline today doesn't really reflect uh, these, these, these titles, these names, uh, because there is, in fact, a very vibrant research program on inequality in macro. Uh, but, but it took sort of a long journey to get up to this point. Okay, and I'm going to try to sort of uh, summarize this journey in a few slides um, in uh, uh, kind of four stages. Uh, Pre-modern macro before 1970, uh, first generation of modern macro, 70 to 90, the second generation between 1990 and 2010, and the third generation, which is post-2010. Okay, and, you know, some caveat is going to be uh, a, an account is going to be entirely subjective and necessarily very, very partial. It's going to be a very partial narrative. Also, I'm going to focus on, on one of the two main branches of macro, which is business cycles. And I'm also going to focus mostly on household heterogeneity, uh, not on, on firm heterogeneity. It would take me like at least another uh, lecture to talk about growth and inequality and, 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 and another one to talk about uh, firm heterogeneity in macro. But I'm happy to, to answer questions later if, if you're interested. Okay, so let's start from like pre-modern macro and the transition to, to modern macro. So macro was born as a distinct field in the 40s as part of the intellectual response to the, to the Great Depression. So, you know, Keynes, Hicks, and Tobin, and Samuelson to some extent, they really wanted to understand the crisis and they wanted to offer a cure. That was kind of the aim of uh, macroeconomic, macroeconomics at the time. And in fact, it's kind of significant the uh, uh, Tobin's definition of macroeconomics, um, which he defined as a subject that attains workable approximation by ignoring the effects on aggregates of distributions of income and wealth. Okay, so it was sort of you know by design uh, that uh, uh, these economists were these macroeconomists, the first uh, generation of macroeconomists, was sort of ignoring the, the income distribution. They really wanted to understand uh, the, the crisis, and they they, they focused on that. Um, in the 1970s, uh, um, Lucas, Prescott, Sargent, and, and Wallace, uh, and among others, they completely reoriented the discipline. Okay, this is what is called uh, sometimes in the uh, in, in macro books the rational expectation revolution. But it was a lot more than that. It was a lot more than rational expectation. Um, macroeconomics became essentially, you know, dynamic, stochastic, and general equilibrium. So the key reference was no longer Keynes' general theory, but it was more like a uh, 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 Debra uh, theory of value, uh, Aaron Debra, essentially, and uh, Debra's theory of value. Um, microeconomics became microfounded. Um, this is uh, you know, the, the key point of kind of Lucas' critique in, in the mid 70s. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's famous, basically, the, the, you know, the, the critique that uh, Lucas moved to Keynesian economics. He said, you know, Keynesian economics is basically populated by unintelligent uh, individuals, okay? Who are not making any choices. They're not, uh, uh, they're not optimizing. Um, macroeconomics became quantitative. 
quantitative in the sense of Kidland and Prescott, where you know, a key part of sort of any macroeconomic paper is what they call the computational experiment. So where you take the model, you calibrate the model, and you um, sort of run the equilibrium on the computer and you sort of um, report uh, the answer from, uh, uh, from the simulation. But, you know, so, so macroeconomics change dramatically, but remarkably, uh, all these, uh, these great macroeconomists uh, they did not really criticize the absence of distributional considerations. So what was the first generation of modern macro? It was representative agent macro, basically. Uh, so there were sort of maybe two distinct approaches. One is what we call the real business cycle, where uh, macroeconomists were um, interested mostly in uh, studying fluctuations of, uh, um, uh, of the macroeconomy being subject to uh, mostly productivity shocks. And this was real models. And uh, the New Keynesian um, uh, approach is that where uh, uh, basically monetary policy took kind of a center stage. Um, so there was a, a division in, in some sense, but you know, the, the common denominator there was basically aggregation, aggregation of agents through complete markets. Okay? So um, uh, you know, uh, complete markets was the key assumption from which the representative agent uh, emerges. And uh, uh, complete markets means essentially that aggregate macroeconomic dynamics are completely independent of the distribution. Uh, there is really trivial heterogeneity whenever there is heterogeneity in the sense that there, is, uh, there may be you know, differences among individuals in the distribution, but those differences are persistent, are permanent in fact. You know, think about basically you know, a planner problem where everyone receives, people can receive different, different weights, they will they receive different consumption, but their relative positions in the distribution does not change over time. Okay, so um, clearly in contrast with, with, with what we see in the real world. Um, it's not like uh, heterogeneity was completely ignored, um, but uh, uh, my understanding is that at the time, microeconomists thought of overlapping generation models as the framework with non-trivial heterogeneity and deviations from, from complete markets. So in this class of models, a stochastic equilibrium is kind of a vector of time series, okay? So sort of, you know, fluctuations in output, consumption, investment, and so on, okay? So this was, Essentially, this was uh, a macro um, uh, from 1970 to 1990. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, macro was interested in studying, uh, obviously, recessions and, and crises. Um, but there was this kind of really powerful observation uh, by Bob Lucas um, that, um, you know, if you compute what are the welfare cost of business cycles, they are really tiny. They are super tiny. Um, uh, he, his, his own calculation led to sort of one half or one tenth of a percent, yes, which is a, it's a very small number. Um, I'm reporting here uh, uh, his uh, uh, basic calculation. Omega is the welfare cost of business cycle. Uh, gamma is risk aversion, the risk aversion representative agent. Sigma is the standard deviation of consumption, aggregate consumption fluctuations. So this is the formula for the welfare cost of business cycle. And you can see, basically, you get this really, really tiny, tiny number, OK? Um, which essentially means that the representative agent in this economy would be willing to pay at most something like $25, okay, if, if its consumption is, say, $50,000, uh, to avoid a recession. Right? So basically, from this perspective, uh, uh, business cycles seem completely uh, irrelevant. Now, let me, let me make a quick detour. I think it's useful to, to make a quick detour to understand what was happening in empirical micro uh, in the meantime. So, Heterogeneity, instead, was really at the heart of the research program in empirical micro. Uh, you know, think about McFadden um, uh, developing the theory of discrete choice under heterogeneity, Heckman, selection on observables, Abode and Card were estimating uh, you know, longitudinal uh, individual income dynamics uh, with tonal heterogeneity, and there was a, a, like a, a big um, um, uh, literature, empirical literature, on testing the complete market hypothesis, uh, which culminated in the paper by Atanasi and Davis in the mid-90s, which write in the abstract that they find a spectacular failure of the complete market hypothesis. Okay? So, um, you know, one, one thing that I, that I remember is that um, uh, when I, right after grad school, uh, after Penn, I, I moved to UCL, and I, I read for the first time uh, this uh, handbook chapter, 
by uh, Martin Browning, Lars Hansen, and Gene Heckman, which is called Microdata and General Equilibrium Models. Uh, it's in the Handbook of Macro in 1999. And in the abstract, uh, uh, they, they write this chapter explores challenges for closing the gap between empirical microeconomics and dynamic macroeconomic theory. So, I mean, everyone, and in particular empirical microeconomists, were well aware that there was, at the time, a really, really big wedge between macro and micro. Fundamentally, uh, you know, macro was micro-founded. It was micro-founded, uh, but it was what I like to uh, call a weak micro-foundation, in the sense that a micro foundation had very weak underpinnings to microdata, a very weak relation with, with microdata. Fundamentally, the representative agent assumption separated macro from micro research. And this takes us to the second generation of macro theories, like 1992, like 2010. Uh, many, many um, uh, economists contributed to this, uh, this second wave of macro theories, uh, among which uh, Aisham Aroglu, Mark Haggett, uh, Rao Yagari, Victor Yosrul, my advisor, and uh, uh, Perkusel and Tony Smith, uh, among others, but many, many others. Um, so what is the key difference between this sort of second generation of macro theories and the first generation? The key ingredient is exactly the deviation from uh, full insurance and complete markets. It's market incompleteness, okay? So in these models, households, individuals are subject to idiosyncratic income shocks, okay? They, they become unemployed, uh, they, uh, they, their, earnings, um, uh, their earnings fall, their earnings rise, uh, and so on and so forth. They, they kind of go through, in a very reduced form in these models, but they kind of go through um, you know, the, the up and downs of, of a career in the labor market, and they're subject to the idiosyncratic income shocks. These income shocks are uninsurable because models, they don't feature complete markets any longer, but what they feature is basically a market structure, a financial market structure that has one asset, which is a risk-free asset, uh, so a non-state contingent asset, and liquidity constraints and borrowing constraints. As a result, as a result, there is a partial pass-through now of individual shocks to consumption, which makes the model a lot closer to the, all the, 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 the enormous empirical work on uh, uh, individual consumption dynamics. You know, that, that sort of started from the permanent income hypothesis, thought about deviations from your access sensitivity, Basel, and so on and so forth. And the key object uh, in these models is an equilibrium distribution of income and wealth and social mobility. So these models, they do feature social economic mobility, meaning that there is a whole distribution of income and wealth and individuals are moving within this distribution, okay? Some individuals are becoming richer and they're sort of climbing up in distributions, others are becoming poorer and they're coming down. Um, and this happens you know, over the life of an individual or across generations and so on. So the stochastic equilibrium in this model is a low motion for the distribution, okay? which is kind of a complicated object. I'll come back on this point. But um, basically, if you, if you call mu the distribution of course income and wealth, the low motion is this function g that maps the distribution today to the distribution uh, tomorrow as a function of, you see this, what I see, so aggregate shocks and uh, you know, kind of institutional features uh, of, the, um, of the environment, uh, which I uh, summarize in this parameter time. Very good. Now, these models have a wealth distribution. Uh, but which theory of the wealth distribution would they have? Well, you know, connecting to, uh, you know, linking to, 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 to Pareto, uh, it's a theory of the wealth distribution that Pareto would have liked. <laughs> Um, in this uh, in this one of his papers, in this paper from uh, 1896, in fact, uh, he writes, he, he wrote in French, uh, he writes that uh, the um, distribution of wealth um, depends on the nature of individuals, on the organization of the economy, and also in part on luck, on chance and luck. And, you know, these three ingredients, which are basically endowments, individual endowments, um, institutions, so say the you know the, the, the redistributive system, the tax and, and transfer system, for example, and luck, uh, randomness, um, um, uncertainty, they all feature prominently in these models. 
they're all like, you know, key feature of this model that determine the distribution of income and wealth and how it changes over time. Also, I should add that there is a, there is a very large literature, uh, which I, again, will take a full lecture to summarize on how to generate a Pareto tail uh, in the wealth distribution. Um, you know, how to generate a, you know, a, a high uh, level of, of concentration uh, in the, uh, at the very top of the wealth distribution, which is something that, you know, uh, economists, uh, uh, policymakers, and everyone is really interested in uh, these days. Okay, so um, let's return to the, to the question of the welfare cost of business cycle from the lenses of this kind of second generation uh, models. Um, and, and, you know, in a way, these second generation models, they sort of embed uh, uh, what uh, uh, Dito in his Nobel lecture described uh, really uh, clearly. Uh, Dito writes, uh, while we often must focus on aggregates uh, for macroeconomic policy, it's impossible to think coherently about national well-being while ignoring inequality and poverty neither of which is visible in aggregate data. Okay, if you like, this is exactly the opposite of the talking squad that I gave you earlier, right? Where by design, you know, they chose to ignore uh, the, the, the distribution. And here, Beaton says, well, even if you're interested in, in, in national well-being, you can't really ignore the distribution because um, you have to uh, incorporate uh, your implications for inequality and, and poverty. So this literature revisits the welfare cost of recessions, revisit the welfare cost of business cycles. And there are sort of, you know, it's a very rich literature again, but there are two things that, that emerge that are important. Uh, the first is a source of amplification of the welfare cost of business cycles, uh, which are related to, uh, connected to counter cyclical and insurable earning risk. So uh, think of this as being unemployment risk, individual unemployment risk, the, the, the risk of being unemployed or to tourists to, to um, uh, uh, risk of a job loss that um, everyone uh, faces. This, this risk is heightened in a recession, right? So by sort of eliminating recession or by, or by, uh, by taming uh, recessions and, and negative aggregate shocks, you also at the same time reduce this uninsurable individual risk. And that leads to clearly an amplification of the gains from um, uh, eliminating business cycles. Uh, but you know, because of the nature of the model, uh, you can add, you can the, 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 you can also connect uh, very very tightly to the empirical micro literature on earning losses of displaced workers. Okay, I'm citing here uh, the uh, uh, seminal paper by Jacobson and and Sullivan, which find that um, uh, earning losses of displaced workers are large uh, and actually quite persistent. So once you incorporate all these elements into these calculations. You know, uh, uh, so Lucas calculation becomes very, very different. Uh, and, I mean, in a way, it doesn't really, you know, change on average that much, but you have a whole distribution of welfare cost of business cycles and the cost of recession can actually be a hundred up to a thousand times bigger for certain groups of workers, the workers that are more exposed to say unemployment risk and, and displacement. Um, also what we learn from, from this, uh, this literature is that stabilization policy has very differential effects across workers. Again, you know, for workers with sort of stable jobs and you know, uh, relatively high wealth, uh, doesn't really matter that much to stabilize the business cycle, but for other uh, types of workers, the most vulnerable workers uh, with the, uh, very low wealth and they're, they're very uh, exposed to the unemployment risk, uh, stabilization policy can be extremely, extremely uh, helpful. Invaluable. Okay, so um, so what was the scope overall of this uh, second generation of, of micro theories? Well, there was an enormous amount of work on the quantitative analysis of distributional effects of aggregate shocks, policy reforms, labor market policies, tax policy, social security policy, um, analysis of demographic change, uh, which has uh, uh, returned in fashion uh, uh, recently. Um, also, going back to the, to the micro foundation, this second generation of micro theories uh, had a much, much stronger micro foundation because uh, micro data now are used to parameterize individual income dynamics to so connect to, say, a bold and card, uh, elasticities, uh, uh, micro elasticities, so labor supply elasticities, intertemporal elasticity substitution, 
Um, and also um, uh, the, the redistributive system, the packs and transfer system, which is a key element of these models. So, so these models, essentially what, what they did establish, establish, you know, uh, they moved on from kind of the, you know, this sort of view of macroeconomics into kind of this view of macroeconomics, which is a distribution that evolves over time, not just aggregates that move over time, but it's our full distribution that evolves over time. And clearly, clearly, uh, establishes basically this direction um, uh, from the macroeconomy, so from shocks to the distribution of outcomes. Most of the research was interested in, in, in sort of analyzing the impact of, as I said, macro shocks, policy reforms, and so on, on the distribution of outcomes. But what about the other, like the other um, uh, direction, the arrow going the other direction from inequality into the macroeconomy? Well, here, the result was actually quite disappointing. In fact, this second generation of macro theories essentially found no impact of the distribution for macroeconomic dynamics. A big result, a very important result, a result that is sort of a, a milestone, a, a really a watershed for macroeconomics. Um, and it's a result that is uh, due to uh, uh, Cruz and Smith, their 1988 paper. I mean, you know, there was, you know, I was uh, um, just out of, of grad school at the time. There were many, many people that uh, had this intuition, but, you know, they, they were the ones that really formalized it in the best possible way. Uh, this result is called approximate aggregation. So I'm, I'm reading from, uh, from their paper. Our main finding, at Cruz and Smith right, is that the stationary stochastic equilibrium, um, in the, sorry, in the stationary stochastic equilibrium, the behavior of macroeconomic aggregates can be almost perfectly described using only the mean of the wealth distribution. Okay, so only the mean means basically, you know, only the the, the, the aggregate, only the uh, the aggregate, um, let's say capital stock, aggregate income, and so on. And in fact, Lucas uh, in his uh, early lecture in 2003 uh, summarized the state of the affairs at the time by writing. For individual behavior and welfare, of course, heterogeneity is everything. But for determining the behavior of aggregates, realistically modeled household heterogeneity just does not matter very much. Okay? And I'm going to, I want to return on this word realistically. But for now, let's take um, kind of Lucas' quote as, uh, as given. Um, so, you know, this result kind of injected uh, new blood into the representative approach to, to business cycles. Um, and uh, let me try to uh, explain um, uh, quickly um, why these approximate aggregation results uh, arises in uh, uh, these class of models. Okay, so what I plotted here, I plotted uh, uh, for one of these models, like a simple, say, Ayagari, uh, the consumption policy function, okay, as a function of uh, uh, cash in hand or wealth for three levels of uh, income. So these would be like the rich individuals, then there are the uh, kind of middle class and then the poor individuals. And on top of it, I plotted the uh, distribution of wealth across individuals. Okay, so the, the thing you should notice is, so let's focus first on the, on the policy function, the consumption policy function. The consumption policy function is clearly nonlinear, is concave and in particular, uh, it's very concave around here, which is sort of near zero, which is the borrowing constraint that the agents are facing. But as soon as you move away from zero, the uh, consumption function becomes linear, becomes very linear, in fact, extremely linear, with a slope that is basically the slope of the uh, consumption function of, say, a permanent income hypothesis consumer, okay? So the NPC for this, uh, uh, Individuals would be the discount rate uh, raw. Okay, so it's so kind of a very, a very small number. As you can see, this, this line is pretty flat. Okay, so, so now think about essentially a linear decision rule. Okay, so if you have a linear decision rule and you want to uh, uh, try to think whether you know, the distribution, which I'm plotting here in purple, matter, the answer is no, because if you integrate a linear decision rule under distribution, you obtain the mean. Essentially, the distribution doesn't really matter, okay? So what is key, essentially, <clears throat> for, this, for this model, what delivers the, the, the approximate aggregation result, is that the nonlinearity 
of the decision rules of you know, choices, people's choices as a function of wealth occur only essentially for constrained people, so for, which are very few in this model and are poor. So they don't really count, they really account for a large share of wealth in the economy. Most of the wealth is held by, you know, up here, here there's a very long tail where individuals are essentially linear. Okay, so all that matters is the mean. And uh, uh, Cruz and Smith, they simulated their economy and then they simulated a standard business cycle model with representative agent. And they found that the descriptive statistics in terms of cyclicality of consumption, income, uh, investment, and so on, they're very, very similar. All right, so this takes us to the third generation, okay? The third generation of, of, of macro theories, uh, uh, which uh, uh, I dated from 2010 uh, onward. Um, so why, why do these second generation models fail in sort of generating a meaningful feedback between inequality distribution and macroeconomy? I would say mainly for three reasons, okay? The first is that in these models, the rich are simply scaled up versions of the poor. There's a lot of homothenticity, especially in preferences in, in everything, uh, um, constraints and so on in this model, which means that basically that you know the poor are the poor are poor are constrained. You scale them up, they become unconstrained, they become uh, permanent evil consumers. The second reason is that consumption behavior, even though it's actually a lot more, a lot closer to the data than the representation model, uh, it remains actually quite at odds with the data. So the marginal risk to consume, in particular for these models, is way too small. Okay, I'll come back on this point later. And third, in most of these models at the time, there was only essentially exposed heterogeneity across individuals, uh, you know, stemming from the history of individual shocks, but not a lot of uh, like exact heterogeneity so in preferences, endowments, technology, and so on. The third generation models, they do address these shortcomings. Okay. And what's coming up in the second part of, the, of my talk is like three examples where I show you uh, precisely how these shortcomings are addressed. Um, so, you know, briefly again, here I would need uh, a lot more time, but you know, what are the mechanisms in this kind of third generation, uh, new set of, of kind of macro, or macro models to which inequality affects the macroeconomy? First is demand, okay? So, um, you know, what is key here is in these models is the correlation between uh, in the cross section the cross section correlation between the change in income that is induced by the shock and the margin of risk to consume all of the individuals in the cross section. Okay, this can determine uh, amplification or dampening of the shock. If this correlation is positive, uh, the shock is amplified. If the correlation is negative, the shock is dampened. Um, the second mechanism is through supply, um, and there are many ways to think about this, but one is, for example, you know, if you think about uh, individuals or firms, say, being constrained and constrained and, 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 and constraints become tighter in recessions, credit is tighter in recession, that could imply more misallocation of capitalization and therefore lower output. It's another um, way to sort of see the feedback from kind of inequality and distribution into the, the macroeconomic dynamics. And the third one, which I think is very interesting, but it's kind of unexplored uh, to a large extent in these third generation models, is to think about the political economy mechanism, uh, where kind of extreme inequality uh, can lead through political economy mechanisms, through voting, uh, revolution, expropriation, and so on, to very poor economic outcomes and, and crises. And I think we, we have seen, uh, you know, uh, events of, of this of this type in uh, in, in uh, um, countries, say uh, Latin America, recently, for example. Okay, so um, the other thing that is very important uh, when we think about these generational models is that there is an even tighter connection uh, between models and data. So, you know, empirical micro. We talked about empirical micro earlier, from like 70s to 90s, but also empirical micro was subject to like big changes and a big revolution, what is called the credibility revolution uh, in, in econometrics and, and uh, uh, empirical micro. Uh, the, this view is that only RCTs can identify causal effects and structural parameters. And so the criticism uh, to structural models is that uh, the identification of structural models is too dependent on functional forms and all other assumptions of the model. Uh, 
Now, um, you know, macroeconomists, uh, they, they took this very seriously. Um, and uh, um, uh, they, they sort of uh, thought about a, a solution, at least a, a way to kind of combine the best of both worlds, which is use results from RCTs to kind of validate the model parameter duration. So the idea, which has been uh, present in many, many uh, papers in the last, in last uh, 10, 15 years, is to basically reproduce the RCT you're interested in in a partial equilibrium version of the model and reproduce the results there, which gives sort of a, you know, some credibility or plausibility to the parameterization. So you get, again, the best of both worlds, because on the one hand, uh, you have a plausible identification of, of your parameters or the partial equilibrium effects of, a, say, a policy change you're interested in. But at the same time, you have your structural model to study counterfactuals, you know, scaling up, say, of the policy, general equilibrium effects, and so on. Okay. So the way I think about uh, these third generation models is, is uh, um, this sort of micro data meets macro models that, you know, as Francesca mentioned, is, is the name of the, of the group that I, that I run with uh, Eric Hurst and Greg Kaplan at the NDR. So, you know, take the data seriously, the macro data seriously, and build from grounds up. I mean, obviously, there's, there's a lot of work uh, still to be done, but that's kind of the, um, the approach, in a way. OK, so these third generation of macro theories, uh, they kind of they have it all, because they have this kind of two-way feedback uh, from the macroeconomy to the distribution of income and wealth and uh, the, other way, uh, the other way around, and the, uh, the other direction as well, from the distribution to the macroeconomy. So let me summarize. Uh, I think it's a good time to kind of summarize uh, this uh, transformation uh, of, of macro. Um, so, you know, the pre modern macro, there was kind of no role for inequality by design. Uh, the first generation of modern macro, there was no role for inequality by necessity in a way, because, you know, these were the first generation of dynamic uh, equilibrium, stochastic, general equilibrium models. And the, the economists at the time, in the early 70s, they just they did not have the tools, the mathematical tools, and the computer power uh, to solve models with, uh, with distribution. So, you know, they, they sort of, uh, uh, by necessity, uh, there is no role for inequality there. The second generation of modern macro is one where there is a clear um, uh, link between the macroeconomy and the distribution, macroeconomy inequality, but not the other direction, mostly because of the set of assumptions that was made uh, in, this, in these models. Um, kind of, in a way, unaware of the implications. And the third generation of, of modern macro is what you can call kind of distributional macroeconomics, where the distribution takes really like center stage uh, in, uh, uh, in the way uh, shocks are, uh, this, are, are transmitted into the, into the macroeconomy. So that's rich two-way interaction between inequality, inequality and macro. So, uh, what is that explains this transformation of, of macro uh, over the years? Well, I mean, clearly uh, historical events. Uh, we have seen that you know, macro was, was born essentially as a, as a, an intellectual response to the Great Depression, right? So, um, and more recently, uh, many of the, I, I mean, my, my, this my reading of the literature is, is that many of the, of, the, of the big changes came from historical events, uh, like observing witnessing the secular rise in income and wealth inequality and the Great Recession. The Great Recession was, was an important impulse uh, to the third generation of macro models. And I think it's, it's uh, represented well by uh, Janet Yellen's uh, a speech when, uh, when she was a chair, uh, the chair of the Fed in 2014. Uh, she wrote in a speech, uh, prior to the financial crisis, representative agent models were the dominant paradigm for analyzing many macro questions. However, a disaggregated approach seems needed to understand the Great Recession. Obviously, how can you understand the Great Recession without you know, introducing borrowers and savers, uh, homeowners and non-homeowners, uh, without thinking about you know, the, the composition of balance sheet of, of households? Um, and, and she continues, while the economics profession has long been aware that these issues matter, you know, uh, their effect had been incorporated into macro models only to a very limited extent prior to the financial crisis. So I'm glad to see now a greater emphasis on the possible macroeconomic consequences of heterogeneity. And notice the arrow, right? The macroeconomic consequences of heterogeneity, like from the distribution to the macroeconomy. So she was aware that 
a lot of research was being done in, 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 uh, in, in, in inequality in macro, but that arrow was missing, that the arrow from the distribution to, to the macro economy. Obviously, the second reason, obvious reason why there was such a, a change over, over the years was uh, faster computers and better algorithm. I mean, we moved from Dynair, uh, which is software that I, you know, I, I used uh, uh, or similar you know, to Dynair when I was in grad school, to TensorFlow, uh, which uh, allows us basically to use like machine learning algorithms to, to solve for that low motion distribution that I showed you earlier, which is a really complicated object. Uh, machine learning is very helpful in uh, getting uh, accurate solutions for very high-dimensional models. And also better data, better data, better micro data, you know, large, big data, um, large-scale, granular administrative data sets uh, are really, really uh, instrumental in uh, um, uh, sort of getting macroeconomists to think a lot more deeply about uh, the micro microstructure. So uh, I want to give you like you know three examples of, of uh, micro data and the way kind of micro data uh, change in a way this kind of third generation of macro models uh, because I'm going to use uh, uh, some of these in, in my in the second part of, of my talk. Uh, the first one was the realization um, that the first fact was the realization uh, that labor income shocks are not normally normally distributed; they're not Gaussian. Okay, so here's a, um, based on uh, work uh, for it's a plot that I've taken from work uh, of uh, one of my co authors, Fatty Guggen, and, and, and his co authors. Um, what I'm plotting here is uh, you know, the red distribution is a normal distribution with a certain variance, which is exactly the variance in the data, and the blue distribution is the distribution of earning shocks in the data. Okay, and you see that uh, the earning shocks are very far from normal. Uh, in fact, a, a very good, a much better description of uh, uh, you know individual labor income shocks that, uh, that that you know workers are subject to is that you know there's a lot of ex big excess kurtosis, meaning that the kind of shocks are kind of infrequent, okay. But when they hit, they are very large. They can be very large, okay. The large negative shock and large positive shock. Um, the second fact that is particularly central to my research, but to this third generation of models in general, is that the marginal propensity to consume out of um, uh, windfall, say unexpected, unanticipated windfalls, small windfalls of income, for example, tax rebates, uh, economic impact payments, uh, and so on, uh, are large. The marginal propensity to consume, on average, the aggregate NPC is large. Um, so it's not the NPC of the representative agent, uh, which is uh, say you know the monthly you know the annual NPC would be the discount rate, so like you know three, four, five percent. So the monthly NPC would be really tiny, but is actually an order of magnitude bigger. On average, is around you know fifteen monthly NPC would be around fifteen percent. So an annual annual NPC would be like 40, 50 percent, uh, and it's decreasing. Uh, decreasing uh, steeply in liquid wealth, meaning that you know people with a lot of liquid wealth they do behave like uh, Ricardian, you know, a permanent income representative agent consumers, but uh, all the others they don't. And the third fact is is very relevant uh, for these third generation models is the observation, the fact that the rates of return on saving um, are increasing in the wealth level. In the wealth level, and that is a large source of uh, wealth inequality and the increase in wealth inequality over time. Okay, this is a plot of like the median return by percentiles of wealth distribution. This is from Norway, um, a paper by Luigi Pistaferi and co-authors. You see how steep this relationship is. People at the top distribution at median returns, which are you know almost six times. Uh, as large as people at the bottom of the distribution. Clearly, these people invest in they, they have deposits or cash. These people invest in stocks or are entrepreneurs, uh, they have private businesses, and so on. Okay, this is all. These are observations that really change kind of the way we um, uh, we we thought about really key elements of the model. You know, income dynamics, um, marginal price to consume, and uh, 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 wealth accumulation. Okay. Good. So 
this was kind of my, you know, my, my summary of the uh, history of macro to this point and, and the focus on the this third generation of models. I want to, in the rest of my, of my talk in the last uh, 15 minutes or so, um, I want to uh, talk about three examples. Uh, three examples of, uh, um, of these third generation models, which are papers I, I, I wrote. Uh, so again, it's going to be very, very subjective and partial in a way. Um, the first one is uh, about the aggregate consumption response to fiscal stimulus payments. This is something that Francesca mentioned in, uh, uh, in her um, incredibly uh, uh, generous presentation. So, okay, so consider a Ricardian, what, I, what is called a Ricardian experiment, okay, in a representative agent model, meaning you, cut land, you, you increase lump sum transfers today and you cut lump sum transfers in the future so that the intertemporal budget constraint is uh, balanced. This Ricardian experiment in a representative agent model has no impact on consumption whatsoever. Okay, because uh, the representative consumer is on the other equation, the discounted present value of income for the individual doesn't change. And so consumption consumption doesn't change. Uh, we know from um, Econ 101. Now, the second generation of macro models can surprisingly has in fact similar implications, similar implications. Uh, and this is, um, uh, was fleshed out in, his, in the John Market paper of um, Jonathan Heathcote. Uh, one of my long-time co-authors, it's a beautiful paper in the review of studies. Uh, and why, why is it the case? Well, because um, the aggregate MPC in these models is nearly the same as for the representative agent. Okay, so it's something about like 2% quarterly, slightly larger, but not much larger. Okay, and why is it the case? Well, I, 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 I explained it when I described the approximate aggregation, right? Because the hand to mouth households, the one with the high margin of risk to consume, the constrained households, are few um, in, uh, uh, in, in those models and they are very poor. So they don't account for a large share of consumption. Now, the third generation models have instead large transfer multipliers, which are consistent with the evidence. Because the evidence, as I explained, is something like a 15, 20% margin of to consume and a large impact on, um, you know, a, a sizable impact on aggregate consumption. And why is that? Because in the model, the aggregate MPC can be an order of, of, of magnitude larger. And uh, uh, the reason is that the hand to mouth households are many more uh, through the lenses of these third generation models and of a different type. Okay, and let me explain uh, this point in the in the next uh, couple of slides. This is based on, on a paper with, with Greg Kaplan. Okay, so let's think about the measurement in the data of hand to mouth from the viewpoint of what I call the one asset model. So the second generation models, where basically the, the only asset that is traded is uh, you know some assets. It could be like a um, wealth, um, say a bond or a stock. Doesn't really matter. Um, so there is one concept, which is net worth, right? Uh, net worth, assets minus liabilities. And um, the, um, um, the hand to mouth households are defined as do those with zero or you know, very small net worth. Now, if you go to the, say, the server of consumer finances in the US um, and you measure what is the share of agents with very close to zero or a very small net worth, you get this plot here. And you see that, yes, in fact, there are very few, okay? Kind of around 10% of households are, uh, are hand to mouth. Uh, and also, you know, they account for a really, really small share of consumption because uh, precisely because they're poor. Now, what is the changes when you think about hand to mouth behavior from the viewpoint of a two asset model, okay? So think about uh, now a, a world where there are two assets, okay? Let's say, a liquid asset, okay, say deposits, bank deposits, and an illiquid asset, okay, let's say housing or retirement account for uh, 1K in the US. Now, now you have to kind of change the definition of hand to mouth because what matters really for consumption smoothing at large extent is liquid wealth, right? So, you know, so now you still have what we call the now the poor hand to mouth which are those with zero liquid and liquid wealth, which are about you know, 10, 
But now, like a second group emerges from the beta, which are individuals they have, they, who have zero or very low liquid wealth, but sometimes substantial illiquid wealth. Okay, those would be, for example, say young homeowners with uh, housing wealth, but say a large uh, mortgage, um, where you know most of the income that comes into the bank account is uh, paid uh, in say mortgage payments and other um, uh, other expenses, and so at the end of say of, of the pay period, at the end of the month, very little cash remains on the on the bank account of these individuals. This would be the wealthy hand to mouth individuals. And once you add the second category, two things happen. The first one is the number of hand to mouth goes from like 10% to like 35%. Okay, it's like a third, 30 to 40% of households are of this type. And the second thing that happens is that these households now, they actually, they have some wealth. So they actually, they do consume a lot more. They, they, they at least their desired consumption is much larger than the ones of the, of the poor and to mouth. So they account for a much larger share of consumption in, in the economy. Okay, um, so um, let me perhaps spend, you know, two minutes, you may, you, you, know, you may, because exactly, because you may, you may well, what is the rationale for kind of, you know, kind of wealthy and to mouth, right? What is the, uh, the rationale for, um, uh, for um, the um, holding kind of zero liquid wealth and uh, uh, some positive illiquid wealth at the same time. Well, you have to think that basically holding little liquidity uh, entails some costs, which are the welfare costs of not being able to smooth income shocks. And, you know, if you are uh, a wealthy hand to mouth individual, um, you have some illiquid assets, you can kind of withdraw, you say, so you can uh, withdraw some of these illiquid wealth. For example, you can, uh, you can borrow against your housing equity, but that is costly. Uh, there is a transaction cost associated with doing that, uh, which could be of different types, could be psychological, it could be actually obviously real um, in many, many instances. So it's costly uh, to be a wealthy and to multi individuals, but also there's a gain. The gain is that your assets are invested in a, in a, in a, in a vehicle that has a higher rate of return. Okay, housing has a higher rate of return than uh, cash, obviously, you know, a 401k investing in stocks has a higher rate of return than uh, cash. And so if gains exceed cost, here's why you can have this type of behavior arising optimally, rationally in the, in the economy, okay? So it's a trade-off between a higher lifetime consumption and a better consumption smoothing. Uh, so it's like a long run versus short run, higher lifetime consumption in the long run versus better consumption smoothing in the short run. And the extent to which a model can generate this type of behavior uh, depends on uh, all the things that I described earlier, right? I mean, it, you know, how the differential return between liquid and liquid assets, so the, the heterogeneity rates of return, uh, uh, the degree of risk aversion, obviously, but also in particular, the nature of income risk, right? I mean, think about the nature of income risk that we just uncovered from the data. Risk, which is the following type. You know, most of the times, nothing happens to my income. I earn my income regularly. It's a stable income. And then rarely, rarely something bad happens. Say I lose my job or um, a health shock. Uh, these are rare shocks that are very large, but rare. Then clearly you see immediately that sort of investing mostly of your wealth in an illiquid asset. And then paying the transaction cost and withdrawing just when the bad shock happens is actually an optimal uh, strategy. Okay, so the, this nature of, of income risk that we uncovered uh, goes hand in hand with the with the sort of the emergence of the wealthy and wealthy individuals. So you saw these models, this to ask a model, and you get uh, uh, you know these sort of uh, surveys for the marginal of to consume um, as a function of liquid uh, any liquid wealth. Okay, so you see that basically the NPC is very large at zero uh, uh, liquid wealth. Uh, here, because in this model, there is a wedge between borrowing and saving. So uh, there are a lot of households that, that sit at the zero kink of the budget constraint and at the borrowing constraint, which is kind of here. Uh, but what is important is that the, these high NPCs, they actually persist uh, at zero, the liquid wealth and at the borrowing constraint, even for you know, positive amounts of illiquid wealth. Okay? 
And you know, if you superimpose on this MPC surface the distribution of wells, there is positive mass here and here. And so um, uh, overall, basically, you get an MPC uh, that is on average around 15%. There is a large heterogeneity of marginal residue to consume, and so a large macro impact of fiscal stimulus spends. Okay? And if you want to think of this, this model from the perspective of what is different in this third generation relative to the, 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 the second generation, well, you know, many of the rich are not just a scaled up version of the poor. In fact, are, are kind of similar to the poor. Okay, very, very much more similar to the poor in their behavior. Uh, so the, the homotheticity that dominated the second generation uh, breaks down here. Okay, so the second, um, uh, the second type of mod, the, the, the second application of this third generation I want to talk about is one um, where kind of we revisit the transmission mechanism of monetary policy, something also that Francesca mentioned. So if you think about the, the transmission of a monetary shock in a um, uh, representative agent New Keynesian model, um, there are two channels. Okay? There is an intertemporal substitution. Okay? So there is a, say, a cut in the interest rate. And because of the cut of the interest rate, um, individuals, they save less and consume more today. They sort of um, uh, intertemporal substitute between consumption and saving, and they consume more. Okay? They're on the Euler equation. That's what happens. But then there are obviously general equilibrium effects, indirect general equilibrium effects, because in sticky uh, price model, whether we don't have rigidities in, in wages or, or, or prices, uh, this reduction in the, um, in the uh, nominal, say the nominal rate, increases uh, the demand for consumption, which increases the demand for labor, which increases income, and through the Keynesian multiplier, that also increases consumption. Now, if you compute, quantify, the direct and indirect effects in the representative agent of Keynesian model, you uncover that it's all intertemporal substitution. These general equilibrium effects are basically not existing. Okay? So, kind of paradoxically, the new Keynesian model is super neoclassical because it's all about intertemporal substitution and nothing about the Keynesian multiplier. All right? Now, for the reason I explained uh, many times by now, the second generation macro model has actually similar implications because of the a small marginal risk to consume. Uh, the third generation models, uh, which have a large marginal risk to consume, uh, say this two asset model, actually reinstate the importance of the aggregate demand channel and the Keynesian, the, the, the equilibrium multiplier in, this, in these models. And it turns out that the indirect general equilibrium effects now account for the majority of the transmission of the monetary policy shock to the macroeconomy. Okay, so this is based on this, this paper by, uh, uh, by with Kaplan and Moll, where we sort of introduce this, this label uh, of uh, heterogeneous agents and the Keynesian models and Hank models. Um, so, what do you get from these models? Well, you know, you start from the transmission mechanism of the monetary policy shock in, in the rank model, the division model, which is all about direct effects in intertemporal substitution. I mean, this is still there because uh, uh, it's, it's, it's obviously part of the uh, 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 heterogeneous agent model. But, you know, now you add all these other channels, uh, which are related to kind of income effects um, and general equilibrium effects through asset prices, through changes in, in, in labor income, you know, increases in employment, and through uh, fiscal policy, because um, uh, in, these, in these models, uh, monetary and fiscal policy are closely interconnected um, because the kind of equivalence fails. If I had more time, I would uh, talk about it more. Okay, so I don't want to kind of go through the, all, the, all, all the details. I just want to make the point that, you know, heterogeneity again, sort of changes the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. So again, the distribution changes uh, the, the, the macroeconomic impact of, of a shock. Um, and, uh, and the reason, uh, fundamentally, is because we're kind of relaxing one of the constraints of the second generation, which is that now the model is very much in line with the empirical evidence on consumption behavior of individuals with this, through this large marginal price to consume. There is, can kind of mount in evidence uh, that this type of uh, uh, transmission mechanism is, is consistent with what predicted by, by the model. And, and I think this, this class of models uh, to, to sort of study uh, monetary policy are especially relevant today that um, 
uh, many central banks are thinking about kind of changing or modifying slightly their, their mandate, the full employment mandate, uh, and emphasize sort of inclusive growth and inclusive recovery. Whereby inclusive, they mean uh, the fact that you know when a recovery um, uh, takes place, uh, it takes place very unevenly, very unequally across groups of, of, of workers. And there are some which are very vulnerable, which are hired uh, um, and, and come back to employment uh, very last. Uh, in the US would be like women and uh, many minorities. Um, and, and you know the new framework of monetary policy of the Fed um, is sort of interested in uh, uh, trying to change um, the monetary policy rule in order to uh, um, in order to strengthen and extend the recovery so that it becomes more inclusive. So clearly this type of models that I just described are the right way to think about uh, these, the consequences of changing the monetary policy rule. Very good. So last uh, uh, two minutes really, um, I wanna, uh, three minutes perhaps, uh, I wanna talk about this third um, application that is work in progress. Um, as I said, these third, third generation models incorporate a lot more exact heterogeneity uh, among workers and individuals. And, and really, if you think about the, the COVID-19 recession, um, it's really impossible right, to analyze this downturn without considering seriously exact heterogeneity, because you have to distinguish between workers in contact in intensive industries versus not contact intensive. You have to distinguish by occupation whether workers are in flexible occupations where they uh, can work remotely, like all of us, which are lucky enough to, to, to be able to continue our, uh, our teaching, our research just from home, uh, compared to rigid occupations um, where you need to be on site to work. Okay? And the key observation that arises from this class of models when you analyze the, the COVID-19 recession is that the economic so the exposure to the economic shock, okay, the pandemic or the, the, the lockdown uh, is correlated with financial, is very strongly correlated with financial fragility, okay, uh, which has two implications. The first is that this correlation amplifies the aggregate demand shock. The second is that, um, you know, this has kind of implication for the, for the huge fiscal relief package uh, that uh, was implemented by, by the, the US government. Um, and you may wonder whether actually this kind of overinsure to some extent uh, households, uh, certain groups of households. So let me talk about briefly about these two points. Okay, this is uh, what, uh, um, you know, what, what kind of comes out when you sort of uh, calibrate the model to the data. Okay, um, as I said, like financial vulnerability uh, varies a lot across occupational groups. This is the, the group that was uh, hit the hardest by, the, by the, the pandemic shock. Low flexibility to work remotely um, and uh, uh, working in a sector with a high degree of social interactions. Now, these individuals happen to be the one with the lowest amount of, mid, of, of, of liquid wealth holdings and the biggest and the largest amount of end-to-mouth houses. Okay, so more vulnerable to the shock, more financially vulnerable as well. Um, so more, more vulnerable to the consequences of the shocks in terms of welfare. And these are the, the group that was, the, uh, was sort of sheltered in a way by the, uh, from the shock, which are the high flexibility working uh, in low social interaction sectors. And these are you know, high medium wealth individuals and relatively low uh, hand to mouth households. Okay? So really from the lenses of, 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 this, uh, of this model, you understand this connection between uh, um, this sort of exposure to the economic shock and financial vulnerability that is key for the, for the transmission and the consequences. And through the models, you can sort of also study the impact of fiscal relief. I mean, the, the, um, in, in March 2020, the US government passed what is called the CARES Act, which contained um, uh, a, you know, a large degree of, uh, kind of fiscal relief for uh, the, for US households. And what we did, we simulated this, this uh, uh, fiscal relief package in, in, within the model. And um, kind of what you see here, I, I split basically the effect of the CARES Act between the bottom quartile and the top quartile. 
And if you if you see like the top quartile, uh, this, this is the bias baseline, which is the counterfactual without the fiscal support. Uh, for the top quartile, there's not really a big difference. Uh, you know, the, the drop in uh, disposable income goes from like 25% to 20%. But for the bottom quartile, it was a huge amount of uh, uh, fiscal relief that was uh, distributed to these households. So much so that basically disposable income uh, uh, in the counterfactual would be like minus 20% and in the, you know, with the fiscal package is doubled 100%, okay? So these type of exercises, I think makes you think whether uh, there was, some, I mean, obviously it was extremely important that, that to provide social insurance uh, to um, uh, households and in particular to the bottom quartile of households, but you may wonder whether perhaps the, the fiscal relief could have been better targeted. Okay, um, I hope um, I, you know, these three examples give you sort of a, a good idea of the uh, type of research that you can do with, with these kind of third generation uh, models and, and why it's, it's an um, uh, important class of models. Um, so kind of, you know, taking, taking stock um, and concluding, um, as I said at the very beginning, um, you know, there's really like a, a two-way feedback. Uh, between macroeconomics and inequality. You know, macroeconomics and inequality is kind of a, a two-way street. Um, but it was a long journey to arrive at a class of models where sort of the, the double arrow is really present there um, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way. Uh, but I think uh, that now the future is, is bright for uh, distribution of macroeconomics uh, because, you know, this, this class of models offers empirically a unified approach uh, to analyze micro and macro data. Conceptually, uh, it's a unified framework to study both short-term fluctuations and long-run dynamics of distribution, both stabilization and redistributive policies. And you know, what is really important is that in these, in these class of models, any stabilization policy has a redistributive implication. And any redistributive policy can stabilize or destabilize the economy, uh, depending on, on, uh, on the um, uh, the features of, of, of the economy. And finally, technically, it's now much easier and faster to solve these models. So what was a really big technical hurdle 30 years ago uh, is no longer there. You know, so kind of overall, I, um, I want to conclude by, uh, you know, sort of talking to, to kind of all the students uh, out there um, and saying that I think it's a really great time uh, to study macroeconomics. Uh, because there are really important questions uh, to be studied, but also because I think we have a, a, a class of models that is very rich and exciting. And uh, on this, I conclude. Thank you so much, Gianluca. This was uh, super interesting, really. Um, so I would now go ahead and read some of the questions that we have received during your talk. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read them to you. Uh, one by one, and then, and then, so that you can you can reply. So we have a first question from Chris Flynn, um, who asked about uh, the value of using RCT results um, to estimate structural models. So I don't know whether you want me to read to you all the questions and then you will reply, or one by one, as you wish. No, I'm, I'm happy to. Um... I'm happy to, to, to answer like one by one. I'm going to give like brief answers. I don't know. If, um, I think we have like 10 minutes. And we say we'll conclude at 7 30. I don't want to you know, uh, keep, uh, 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 keep you here for, <laughs> for, for hours. Although I, you know, I'm perfectly happy to, to answer more questions later, perhaps uh, when we're not live anymore. Um, but uh, no, this is, in fact, I, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, I, I, I knew, I hoped that, that Chris would. Uh, uh, would listen to the, the lecture, and I, I, I thank Chris very much. We've been colleagues of NYU for many years, and I, um, I always, uh, you know, learn a lot from uh, from Chris. Um, and I, so um, I do think actually that it's uh, um, it's something valuable. Um, I think it's something that macroeconomists um, have started doing. Um, only recently, I would say in the last maybe 10 years or so, but it has actually helped a lot to communicate with the with applied microeconomics. 
Um, and, uh, and I know that one of the uh, uh, you know, most loved papers by uh, macroeconomists of my type is the like the total walking paper on Progressa. That is sort of you know one of the first what's the first paper that, that one does this type of exercise. I, I think they're they're very helpful. I mean I, I also think that uh, it's it's clearly not the you know the, the you know the, the only way in which uh, uh, you know um, identification and structural models. Uh, should be pursued, but I think it's it's a bridge. It's a bridge to communicate with a crowd that um, uh, you know has a bit of a, a reluctance to uh, 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 towards such a models. And, and I think it's it's important to build a bridge because we can learn from each other. Okay, I don't know if Chris disagree. I'm happy to. Talk about it more later, one on one. So I don't know if Chris can uh, can speak. Uh, we we would be happy to uh, if he wants to ask something directly to Gianluca. Thanks. Um, yeah, my question was uh, yeah the the Todd and Wolpen papers. You know I love, but after we go past that, then I run out of examples. Maybe there's not a lot. There's there's two there's two things. So I totally agree with the bridge aspect. But you need a lot of RCTs are done. Um, well, first of all, there's an aggregation issue. They're local off, oftentimes. So to worry about GE effects and so on is difficult for some of these. But the progressive experiment was a big one and was a high stakes experiment. And many of these experiments, I would argue, there are lower stakes and they're setting parameters that they just choose out of a hat essentially, mm -hmm. right? So, so they're not setting parameters optimally for us to learn about some kind of behavioral effects because they want some kind of policy outcome. Right. And so I agree with you, the, the right way to do is, is to do a structural model, maybe without that kind of identification, inform the people doing an experiment, RCT, why don't you look to set the parameters here, right? And then, iterate that way and, and that would be a great way but I think that's certainly true for micro but then there's the question of these things are often local and what about aggregating these things up to you know to the national economy for example where you don't see GE effects in these RCTs yes no, I mean I, I, I think we're on, on the same page I um, I wanted to you know um, to, to mention it uh, because I think it's a really, really, really exciting research area. And yeah, there are I agree. limitations on both ends at the, at the moment, but I think it's like really fertile uh, ground for, say, you know, like a, a dissertation, uh, many, many dissertations, many, many papers uh, to, to try to, to build a, a type yeah. of connection on both ends. So. I just wanted to say, too, I, I really enjoyed the talk. I thought you did a great job. Thanks, Thanks Chris. I'm very generous. <laughs> Okay, next question. So Matteo Santi asks, um, can the proportion of uh, hand-to-mouth households increase during downturns, uh, not only because income decreases and jobs are lost, but also because assets that are liquid in normal times uh, become suddenly illiquid during crises? That's a great point. That's a great point. Both, both, both are great points. Um, I like the second one, which is actually I'm not seen anywhere. Um, in these models, but the, the first one is there, and the first one, so the the, the, the cyclicality of the hand to mouth, I think is one of the big reasons why um, um, why two agent models, um, which are often used as a shortcut to this class of economies, um, they have limitations because in those models uh, where you have like hand to mouth households and say uh, permanent income consumers, the share is exogenous and it's fixed, okay? Well, exactly as you said, and uh, I don't have my, I cannot share my screen here again, but uh, perhaps you've seen it from my plot, the share is actually uh, counter cyclical. So and the share of the mouth uh, goes up in, in recession. And, and I really love your, your observation about the fact that uh, uh, illiquid wealth can become more illiquid uh, uh, because, uh, um, you know, because markets are thinner, um, in, in, in recession, if you think about housing markets in, in you know, a new model, say housing markets with like search models, then that type of thin market in recession would emerge endogenously. Uh, and so uh, 
the, 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 the liquidity nature of, of the liquid asset would, uh, would be endogenous and would, would go exactly the direction it's invested. Okay, and then maybe a related question is also, um, so inequality in the household distribution depends on different endowments. So how important uh, um, is to take into account that the distribution of endowments changes in the cycle, along the cycle? <clears throat> so by, by endowments, maybe, maybe uh, I use a term that is kind of confusing, by, by endowments, I mean really endowments of, of like productivity, productivity endowments, um, which for which there is like a fixed component, say, you know, your, your ability, uh, your education, um, uh, your age, uh, and a component that is more uh, sort of dynamic and uh, related to your labor market history, uh, which has to do with uh, uh, your transition between employment and employment, your, uh, your progress to the job ladder, um, and so on, you know, to careers and so on. Um, so, um, uh, yes, it, th 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 those endowments um, in, uh, in these models, they do sort of the, sto the stochastic process such that um, uh, endowments, they do change over the cycle, uh, I think, in the right way. I mean, in these models, the models that I, that I, that I have in mind that I try to describe, uh, these, these productivity or labor income process are very reduced form, but there are now, you know, sort of uh, heterogeneous agent models with aggregate shocks that try to incorporate um, labor market frictions in a more meaningful way. So I think we're going in the right direction in that sense. Okay, and then maybe we have just a couple of minutes for the last question from uh, Francesco Passarelli, who asks um, to spend more words on the political economy perspective. So in particular, uh, inequality can heavily affect fiscal policy and eventually also monetary policy, which in turn feedback with macroeconomic equilibrio and the business cycle. Uh, so yeah, if you can say something more about this uh, relationship. Um, so I am not an expert. Um, I'm not an expert on political economy. So I, I, I really, I would uh, uh, prefer to kind of, you know, uh, leave the stage uh, to someone's uh, more, uh, the more post, you know, better post of the literature. I, I would say, but I find it, I find it extremely interesting as a, as a connection. I don't think it's a connection that is very well explored in this class of, you know, quantitative macro models. I mean, there are models out there, you know, I think on, on the, just to mention another member of the, of our board, you know, uh, Guido Tabellini's work is kind of all about this in a way. Um, so um, there is, there is a lot of like theory being written and being developed and not so much quantitative analysis in these dynamic macro models. The type of mechanism I had in mind, uh, I think they are important. Uh, and one, one way to see this is sort of how, you know, the, the secular increase in inequality is sort of creating um, a political support, strong political support for, on the one hand, certain types of fiscal policies, say, you know, taxation of the rich, uh, in wealth taxes in, in the US and so on. And those can obviously have a big impact, uh, not just in the long run, also for, you know, for short run fluctuations, transmission of shocks and so on, but also monetary policy. As I said, basically, the, you know, the, 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 the Fed is changing the framework. I think, I think great, you know, mostly in response to this type of uh, uh, political operations, whether it's right or not, uh, that's the reality. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Gianluca, Francesca, thank you very much. This was a great lecture. I think that uh, it's also, I think it would be interesting, but this would take another lecture to explore the, and there are some questions on this, uh, how your distributional macro framework is related uh, to other contributions. There's one question that uh, discusses, for example, the granular and network origins of aggregate fluctuations, the, the contribution by Gabe and Asimoglu. I'm thinking also of the evolution of trade theory uh, from representative agents into heterogeneous agents. Uh, so I think it's uh, it would be I mean, it probably would take another two or three lectures, but it's also interesting to see. It would be interesting to see to understand how.
you know, the evolution in macroeconomic theory can be related also to other evolutions in the in in the, in the literature and other other approaches to economics. So that would be certainly very interesting. Anyway, Gianluca, thank you very much. I think it was a really fascinating and very insightful lecture. Francesca, you did a wonderful job in introducing Gianluca and thank you for doing this. And well, I'm, really glad, <laughs> I'm really glad we had this lecture. And so we are hoping to see you soon at Il Collegio in presence. Yes, and I, I also do. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. It was a lot of fun. And I, uh, I'm great. Looking forward to seeing you in person.